Hi, Misha here, and it occurs to me that while I've had several SKSs in many videos over the years, I don't know that I've ever done kind of a breakdown of the variants and how they were different. If I have, it's been a while, and I felt like doing it today, mostly because I was rearranging things. So in this video, we're going to talk briefly, as brief as I can anyway, about the history, the adoption of the SKS, Simonov's self-loading carbine, firing 7.62 by 39, where it started off at the tail end of World War II, the Great Patriotic War, how it was nearly a dead end, but then kind of received a second life through allies of Russia, and really has become one of the most famous guns in the world. Now one time the SKS kind of had the, the indignity of being thought of as a cheap Kalashnikov, a cheap AK. And it is certainly not. One thing, it's a machined receiver gun, 20 inch barrel, and actually of high quality. But for another, it's a totally different operating system. And it's stripper clip or charger fed. And uh, yeah, just just a different critter. It just happens to fire the same cartridge as the AK and be from the same nation. But it's kind of like saying, you know, the, uh, the Johnson, the 1941 Johnson, is the same thing as an M1 Grand. Totally different system. So with that, we'll start off with the original variants and then work our way around the world. Let's get into it. To begin with, let's give the SKS some context. On the bottom is a World War II Russian M44 Mosin carbine firing 7.62x54R. And of course on the top is a World War II Russian SVT-40, firing the same cartridge. And really the SKS is right in between them. I might revisit, probably will, the SVT story in another video, but just real briefly, there was a back and forth between Tokarev and Simonov as to who could make the first successful self-loading rifle for Russia. Not, of course, accounting for the 1916 Fedorov. The first round would go to Simonov. In uh, 1936, well, 1937 technically, the AVS-36 was adopted, which was a select-fire Simonov design, firing, of course, 762 by 54 r But it quickly had problems, some just to do with the fact that it was a select-fire 54R gun, others to do with durability. So, while it was never officially canceled or replaced, around 1938, the SVT-38 went into production and the AVS-36 was halted. But then, the SVT-38 didn't do so well during the Winter War in Finland, and Stalin was not too pleased, and he was considering giving Simonov another chance. Well, Tokarev came out with the SVT-40 here, which corrected several issues, and so it was put into production. But, Simonov was hard at work. He had an updated rifle, known as the SVS-41, as well as a carbine with a 20 and a half inch barrel, known as the SKS-41. But these were still firing 760 by 54 r they were actually scheduled to go into testing and trials against a carbine version of the SVT-40, known as the SKT-40, in July of 1941. But this never happened. You know why. Operation Barbarossa. Germans always getting in the way. This kind of delayed everything. It kept the SVT-40 in production, although Tula would switch over to Mosin the Gaunt 9130 production, mostly. And uh, 
yeah, so it would continue, but quite briefly. Anyway, anyway. Skipping forward, they're mostly making Mosins, but the PPSH-41 and PPS-42, later PPS-43, were really showing the value of submachine guns. And Semenov was, was pretty busy working on his anti-tank rifle, the PTRS-41, which actually got him a lot of acclaim and even a prize from Stalin. Yay. But in 1943, the war was starting to turn in favor of the Allies in Soviet Russia. And they were starting to see a new cartridge being used against them by the Germans. 7.92 by 33 Kurs. America was also using 7.62 by 33 in the M1 carbine. Therefore, a new round was created in Russia in 1943, 7.62 by 41, later to be updated to the by 39 we know and love today. So, Simonov was you know, tasked or decided to work his design for the new cartridge, and he found it to be quite an easy process because it was a rimless or recessed rim round. He used his same short stroke gas piston, tilting or tipping bolt, and one thing that Stalin decided he wanted, or rather didn't want, the SVTs had detaching 10 round mags. Stalin decided to go to a fixed magazine for a few reasons. One, so it wouldn't be lost by the soldiers, and two, Stalin felt the fact that they were having to make three magazines for the SVT-40 per every one rifle made was just a waste. So, hey, let's go to a fixed mag like the Mosin. Hey, it works fine in the Mosin. Let's do it. So, uh, Simonov would work with a five-round version and a ten-round version. And then in 1944, they started having trials. They wanted to adopt four new guns, all firing the new 7.62 intermediate cartridge. They wanted a bolt-action rifle, essentially a Mosin Nagant. They wanted a self-loading carbine. They wanted a light machine gun, which would become the RPD-44. And they wanted a submachine gun slash assault rifle, which would ultimately become the AK-47 or AK Type 1 through 3. Now, there would be a short run of SKS carbines with 20-inch barrels, folding blade bayonets, produced in 1944. These would be used on the Belarusian front, and they would be used on the march on Berlin in 1945. Field tests proved quite nice. So, right before the war ended, Simonov's carbine was adopted as the SKS-45 here. The bolt action, firing 760 by 39 never went anywhere. It was never produced because it wasn't needed. And the SVT-40, well, it was in very low rate production in 1943 and 1944, and it was officially taken out of full production in January of 1945. Now, Tokarev did attempt to work with the new round, but... He just, he never had real success. This would have been his last major hurrah. And that's because Tokarev was from a previous generation to Simonov. Simonov was full generation younger. But still, there have to be said to be a lot of similarities. Short stroke gas piston. Tilting bolt. Kind of a top cover disassembly. They really do have a lot of similarities. The biggest difference is just being overall barrel length and, of course, the cartridge itself. You can tell that they had their roots in the same programs dating back to really the late 1920s. Now, you would think, being adopted in 1945, the SKS would go into full production. But actually, it was shelved and very nearly was not produced. With that, let's talk about Russian production and Russian variants. So the one we've been looking at is a relatively early example. And here is a late example, sometimes called a letter code.
production did not occur throughout the 1940s. Rather, Russia was working on the Kalashnikov system, and the SKS was already starting to look dated, a self-loading semi-automatic only carbine using a 10 round fixed mag fed from clips with a non-detaching bayonet yeah it, it started to look a little dated so while Simonov was praised and, and, and prized for his development it was kind of shelved as a backup plan but then around 1948, they thought, man, maybe we should look into this. Because in 48, they were trying to get the AK into full production. And this is when they started to run into issues with the Type 1 stamped receiver of the AK. Now, they're not quite as clear-cut as you would think, but they had issues. So they decided to put the more conventional SKS-45 into production in its milled receiver. The first year was 1949 at Tula. And the original version would have some interesting features. It had a 20 and a half inch barrel. It had a spike or pig sticker bayonet, much like the M44, just on the bottom. The bore was not chrome lined and it had a spring loaded firing pin something I bet a lot of American shooters wish they had kept. It also had nice deep bluing, hardwood stock, what have you. It wasn't long though before they went around 1950 to a blade pattern bayonet here. And this one's an interesting version because it's a transitional one. The original Pig sticker bayonets were blued or blackened. But soon they would go to kind of a silver or goldish silver as they appear today finish. But there was a period where they would have a blade bayonet that was blued. And that's what we have here. One good thing, around 1951, they went to a chrome-lined bore. But they also dropped the... Um, the spring-loaded firing pin going to a free float inside. Not exactly sure why. So really by 1952 the design was pretty stable. At least the early features were gone. But they would make some economies to speed up production. And production would last at Tula until at least 1956. Some sources say the letter guns are from 1957 and 58. No one knows for sure. It's also worth pointing out that Yushesk would produce these very briefly in 1953 and 1954. Because Yushesk at this time was pretty busy working on the AK, but... For whatever various reasons, during the time of the introduction of the AK Type 3, they ordered them to produce the SKS carbine. But that was very brief, and if you find the NHS marked one, they're pretty uncommon to rare in America. So let's talk about a few of the changes that Tula would make. Honestly, thinking about it, I guess saying simplifications really isn't fair. But they did streamline production, and make some improvements. There was a change to the trigger guard, trigger pack arrangement here. Notice how it's smooth, and the release for the magazine is kind of dished in. You look at the later produced one, and there's a hump here, and this is simplified just to be a straight edge with some patterning. The original safety was just kind of tensioned on. They added kind of a detent and spring where it kind of clicked into position. 
a little easier to use. And maybe the bluing quality went down slightly. They also would use a few different uh, different types of wood. Just showing you the underside here. So let's fold these down. Another noticeable change is the gas block. This is very curvy here. And this has noticeable detent to it, just different shaping. A little easier to machine, also a little bit lighter weight. Likewise, they added a lightning cut to the bayonet lug mount here. Or bayonet mount, I should say. See, this is smooth. It's actually required a little bit more machining, frankly. But, saved a little bit of weight. And as I already mentioned, we kind of quit bluing our blade, leaving it in the white. And one of many reasons for that was these were being used as second line or even parade guns in Russia. About the time they were put into production was the time they decided to switch to a milled receiver for the Kalashnikov, you know, bringing the Type 2 and then soon the Type 3 around. And this is when the Kalashnikov took off as a frontline weapon, firing the same cartridge as this, but also having 30 rounds versus 10, detaching mags, select fire capability. And they discovered a little bit to their surprise that having a 20 and a half inch barrel on this versus the 16 and a quarter on the AK really didn't negatively impact things, especially because of the way Soviet infantry doctrine was at the time. You'd think the longer sight radius would have mattered, but not, not so much. And the SKS, we might think of it as a cheap gun, but uh, frankly, it wasn't. Again, machined receiver and what have you. So its days were numbered in Russia. And in fact, the last couple of years of production were mostly targeted export to kind of send sample guns out to client states. The real death knell for this gun was the introduction of the stamped receiver AKM in 1959 that really proved that an AK could be made cheaply, efficiently, and reliably. And this is when Tula would tool up and start producing AKs, not just Yushchevsk. And by this point, SKS production is over in Russia. Now, of course, again, some would be kept for ceremonial duties, guard duties, parade duties. Some would be used by the militia. And many would be used by hunters, sportsmen, private people. Although in Russia, because of the laws, they actually have to remove the bayonet. Because bayonets are bad. So its time in Russia, frontline service was virtually non-existent. And even its second line service was relatively brief. However, when the writing was on the wall around 1954, Russia did start working on exporting the design, selling it or leasing it or what have you to allies, client states, the Comblock, the Warsaw Pact, and that's where the SKS really takes off. So let's get into some variants. One of the first nations to produce Semenov's carbon outside of the Soviet Union was Romania. This is the M. 56 or model 1956 and if it seems like you're kind of seeing double with our late Tula production that's pretty much exactly right. In 1956 Romania purchased a license to manufacture the SKS and production was set up and by 1957 the Kujer 
Arsenal was turning these out. In between that time and around 1960, they would build over 100,000. Not a huge number, but not tiny. Ironically, it's more than they built of the Mosin M44. It really was exactly like the late style. We have a beechwood stock, blued finish with the bolt in the white. We have a bayonet, silver, and the white. Yeah, it's, it's identical, frankly. And I think one reason the Romania went for this, they were one of the later parties to start producing the AK. They would have some milled AKs from Russia, but they would not start building their own until the AKM when they produced it as the PM-63. So this was kind of a stopgap measure. Now, it must be said that Poland nearly produced the SKS. In fact, they grabbed, oh, a few hundred, maybe a thousand from Russia around 1954-55, designating it as the KSS. But in 1956, Poland kind of rebelled and said, no, we, we're not going to buy and build the SKS. It's a waste of time. The... Kalashnikov, which they called the PMK, is the future. So, the only Polish AK, excuse me, SKSs are roughly a thousand that were originally built in Russia and sometimes were refurbished by Circle 11 factory, Luxnik Radom, but it most stocks. Another European nation that I wish I had an example of is uh, East Germany. Beginning in 1958, they started producing the SKS as the Kirbiner S, Kirbiner Semenov. And it did have some changes, mostly to do with the furniture. And they would build them through about 1961 when they started doing mill decay production. The East German SKS had a different stock style. It had kind of a K98 style sling swivel, pass through swivel in the butt. It lacked the trap door in the butt for a cleaning kit. And it also lacked the cleaning rod under the barrel. Instead, soldiers carried a cleaning kit on their belt pouches. That's just, that's just how they did things. And it had kind of that lighter, more oil finished type wood on it as well. They built a decent number, but unfortunately, very few are in the USA because many were given away to Croatia in the 90s and kind of disappeared into those conflicts. Others were given away to Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. A friend, as I've said in a previous video, does have a Vietnamese bring back East German SKS or Kerbiner S. But don't get too excited. It's in a Chinese stock because the original was destroyed. So that's kind of where we're at. The ones that are here are not in uh, fantastic shape, usually, unfortunately. But what can you do? I had to mention the DDR production. But it's neat. Maybe one day a batch will come in. If you see them, you should buy them, even if they're seemingly very expensive, because they're quite unique. But with that we can kind of get away from the exact clones and copies and start looking at some variants. Let's leave our Romanian M56 as our example piece for a moment on the table when we talk about the Yugoslavian SKSs. Now, the position of Yugoslavia, which was communist under Tito, was kind of interesting. Um, they were not firmly a part of the Warsaw Pact and, well, you know, related to the comm bloc, the revolution had happened pretty independently in that nation. Obviously it had some support, but it wasn't a puppet regime as such. Therefore, yeah, things were different. It's, it's an interesting thing. Also, in the late 50s, Russia recognized the fact that the SKS was just no longer really that valuable or marketable. So, in kind of a goodwill gesture to schmooze up to Tito and his regime, 
they gave Yugoslavia production rights and tooling and expertise to make the SKS. It was adopted in 1959 as the PAP, which is basically self-loading rifle, model of 1959, or M59. And it was in production at the Krena Zastava factory by 1960. And this initial version looked like the late production Russian version. That's why I don't have one. They're neat enough, but the differences are really only in markings. Otherwise, they look the same. They can have beechwood or sometimes walnut furniture, especially on the early ones. And they would run these through about 1967, building over 225,000. But then in 1966, they adopted this pattern, which is the M5966, which is the same machine, but modified to have a rifle grenade launcher, which required several changes. And they would produce these up through 1970. And they are a little longer and heavier. We have a rubber recoil pad. Although, interestingly, it still does have the trapdoor for a cleaning kit. And it is possible to get your fingers stuck in there and rather hard to get it out. I, I mean, in theory, I, I definitely never did that long ago. Otherwise, it's the same blued finish. When we come to the bayonet, you'll notice it doesn't have a ring on the bottom. And of course, that's because it can't just slip over the muzzle on a standard SKS. We have this thing. So instead, it has this lip that locks on to the bottom of the launcher. We have this spigot. There's a couple of variants of this. And of course, we have a gas cutoff here with sights you can lift up for grenade launching. And of course, this means we have a unique gas block. It's also worth pointing out that Zastava was creating these at a time when uh, they were already building early AK derivatives. Also notice there's a little bit of difference in the handguard here warm handguard arrangement. Yeah, this is why I like the M5966. It's just it's a little different. Showing a few changes here. I'll set you down for a second so I can close my sights. To do that, you just kind of pull up and down. You can slide your cut off. There's also another variant that is often called the M5966A1 that has flip up night sights will flip down in the case of the rear sight here not all had these but it does kind of mirror what we see on the, their AKs in both cases grenade launcher and night sight otherwise Again, pretty standard SKS. These do have more of a matte blued finish, at least some of them. Still have the silver boat. Flipping it over, just so hopefully you can see some markings. I do my best. The sling swivel is also different because it's part of our new gas block. It's a little wider that uses this Yugo sling. There are actually some variations in sling thickness used on Yugo SKSs. Some of them have a narrower rear swivel, or a narrower sling or strap as some people like to call these. So there are variations in these. And they would build quite a large number at the 5966, nearly 170,000 for Yugoslavia's own military use, plus about another 100,000 for export, because Yugoslavia was always happy to get some cash from overseas. And so this brings, uh, you know, total production in Yugoslavia to about 500,000. 
between 1960 and 1970. So, you know, about 50000 a year. Not bad for a large communist-type factory. But just because they took them out of production in 1970, which is incidentally the year they officially adopted the Kalashnikov derivative, the M70, in that country, they still continue to maintain, refurbish, and rebuild these throughout the 80s, and quite a large number of these saw use, sometimes quite tragically, in the Yugoslavian Civil War in the 1990s. Some of them have very interesting carvings and stuff on the stocks, but this one was one bought eons ago as unissued in the Cosmoline. But we'll talk about the American market at the end of this video. So yeah, the Yugo SKS, M59, M5966, and M5966A1. There's also a long-running myth that these have teak wood furniture sets. Uh, this is not true. It's, uh, it's beech wood. Again, some early ones can have walnut as well. One thing to point out... Bore, not chrome lined. As you know, that's kind of one of those Estaba things. They just didn't chrome their 760 by 39 bores. Romanian was definitely chrome, though. And that's pretty much SKS production in Europe. Lots of nations use these, but they just bought them from Russia or maybe a couple of the other countries making them. Because it was a transitional gun. So its time in frontline service in Europe was quite brief. Even in Yugoslavia, it was mostly a police, second line, militia carbine. However, when we go to the Far East, that's where the SKS really found its legs. We have to bring our Russian late type back so we can talk about the Chinese type 56 carbine. The country, the gun, that really put the SKS on the map. And it's quite possible that China was the first nation to produce the SKS outside of Russia. Certainly they were set up early in turning out their first guns in 1956. These would be built at the Xiangxi Arsenal Factory 26. And for the first couple of years, they were built with Russian parts, even in the beginning, Russian supervisors. But throughout 1957, 58, they started producing more and more parts domestically. So by 1959, 1960, they were pretty much all Chinese built, and production would continue. And initially, they were very, very similar to our Russian friend. They had a machined trigger guard. They had a blade bayonet. They had lightning cuts. They had elite style gas block. And this one I've kept over the years because it's in an interesting stock, often called a jungle stock. This is a fiberglass, not a wood stock. Now, most Chinese guns were in various types of wood, but they did do a large number of these stocks for humid, tropical environments. And often called Bakelite, this is really a fiberglass material, but it does prove quite durable, complete with the fiberglass upper handguard, and they had a few different types. It even has a storage compartment in the stock. The rear swivel is a bit reinforced instead of having the screws on the bottom. They're on the side here as you see. That's just for strength purposes. And they have kind of this neat mold seam coming down here. Thanks to the late or the early style Chinese late style Russian trigger guard. Our bayonet and what have you. And a lot of these guns had very little in the way of markings because eh, many theorized they were sent to Vietnam or just elsewhere that China didn't really want to get acknowledged for.
and some of the early so-called Sano Soviet guns have some quite interesting markings as well. And you can see this earlier production, 56, has the lightning cut in the bolt carrier. Pretty standard barrel shoulder profile, standard rear sight. In standard late gas block, yeah. So the real the, the real difference here is uh, this synthetic stock, and that's kind of why I wanted one of these. Most of the time, you do find synthetic stocks with the blade bayonet styling. Even when you find the spikers with these stocks, they tend to be kind of retrofits. Yeah, these were in production well before the split between Russia and China. And they were cranking them out. Factory 26 would still remain the main arsenal, at least up through the 70s. But some secondary productions would be taking place uh, throughout different ones. You can find all kinds of interesting markings on these guns. And interesting variants. So I have this one because it's a unique stock in early style. And I have this Type 56 because it has nearly all of the later style features. One thing to point out before I forget, notice the kind of curly Q metal on the end of the sling here versus the more traditional leather tabs. Again, that was for humid environments not to rot away. All right, so an early change, they moved the sling swivel to the side of the stock here, from the bottom to the side. And that really does make it more of a better carbine to throw across your back. And of course, Around 1965, they went to the pig sticker bayonet, which I guess in a way is kind of going back to the pig sticker, because the original 1949 Russians had these too, although it was a slightly different style. And then... Around the late 60s, early 70s, they started looking for ways to streamline production. And this is really China where they stepped up. They went to a stamped and welded trigger guard versus machined. They also simplified the safety, no longer giving it a pattern, just kind of bare stamped metal. They also took the rear sight that has this lightning cut in it. And underneath, I knew that was going to happen one time here. And get the camera away. Sling. Sorry. Slings, folks. They like doing stuff to you. Is that was. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As I was saying, they took the. Lightning cut off the sight here. And even simplified it on the underside a bit. They took the late pattern Russian gas block. And simplified it to this kind of bubbly pattern. There's a few different... Chinese gas blocks. This is just one of the later styles. And not surprisingly, they removed the lightning cut from the bayonet mount housing, what have you. Flipping these over, we can see they removed the lightning cut from the bolt carrier. 
as well, simplifying that. And here's a look at our newer pattern of gas block from this side. And of course the bayonet required a different cutout in the forearm for the pig sticker, much wider. But you can always tell it's, it's wider but shallower. And as you can see here, the pig sticker bayonet is quite a bit longer than our uh, traditional blade giving him a little more reach and there are a few variants of this as well this is kind of the three-sided one there's even a, a QD one which is kind of interesting so yeah China really ran with this and you know in the original timeline here the AK had a screw-in barrel. When they went to the later stamped receiver type 56, they went to a press and pin-in barrel. For a time, they continued doing the screw-in barrel for their SKSs. But sometime in the mid to late 70s, they switched to doing a press and pin-in barrel, which gives it a very different shoulder. Now, these are still on a stamped receiver, excuse me, a machined receiver, although they would even do some late with stamped receivers, although these are probably more for export than their own, own consumption, but who knows. But the, uh, the press and pin and barrels were pretty heavily produced. Yep, yeah, slings. I should be thankful that the guns were cooperative up to this point. <laughs> of course, by the 70s, even China recognized the gun was becoming a little dated, but it, it was well suited to their needs. It was easy to maintain. They liked that it was semi-automatic only, at least for certain troops. The longer sight radius was appreciated. These often were kind of issued as kind of de facto DMRs. They were used in kind of backwater areas villages, what have you. And again, they were exported en masse to places like Vietnam. So they really did like it, and they continued to issue it. Now, China had a lot of upheavals, upsets, and problems in the 60s and 70s, and that also contributed to why the SKS remained in production and use there as long as it did. But really, by 1980, it was out of full production for military use. And so many of the ones we received in America were either reconditioned to surplus guns, or guns assembled in small batches from existing parts and for existing special runs and special orders. Nevertheless, production in some capacity did continue through the 1980s, and perhaps into the 1990s. How many SKSs did China build? No one knows. Probably not even China. But I've seen estimates as high as 10 million, and considering how many are in America alone, that doesn't seem impossible. Not at all. Because again, not only did China keep a large number for their own use, they exported quite a number to other nations and with that let's talk about one of those nations that's actually become quite famous in recent years because of chinese sks's chinese type 56 carbines coming out of there and we end of course with the albanian sks a lot of mystery surrounds these and this is probably the most unique sks variant that at least we have in America. <clears throat> and uh, 
Yeah, a lot of mystery. For one, we don't even really know the name officially of this. Some sources say it was called the July 10th Carbine, based on the independence date of Albania. This is wrong, because Albania's independence day is like November 22nd. Others just say it was called the SKS. Well, fair enough. Others say it was called the Type 56-1, after the Chinese. Or just run it all together and call it the Type 561. What we know is China gave large numbers of their domestically built Type 56s to Albania. These are the ones that have come into America in the past uh, 10 years or so and are considered CNR because they were in Albania long enough that they were no longer Chinese. So that was kind of the pattern that that Albania started with, hence why we still use our uh, pig sticker bayonet here. And in many ways it does resemble a later production Chinese with the sling swivel on the side of the stock. But it also has many differences. One that will jump out at you is the longer forearm and handguard here compared with the Chinese, which has much more exposed gas tube. See? Interestingly, this kind of resembles in some ways the early Simonov designs and prototypes with the longer handguard. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but it's kind of interesting. We have a similar gas block to our Chinese, but it is a little more like the original Russian with kind of the rounded face. We still do have the lightning cut in the bayonet lug. We do still have a lightning cut rear sight. But on the bottom, we have a unique magazine. It's a more bubbly, rounded shape compared to anything else we've seen. The catch, I'm trying to get my sling out of the way without dropping it again. Gravity can be a bitch. <laughs> It's a little different here in the trigger guard, but pretty similar to the late Russian. But the magazine is uh, pretty different. Another major difference is to do with the stock. This is made out of beech wood, at least usually. And it has two holes instead of one. One for the standard kind of cleaning kit. The other one for, for an oiler. Kind of interesting the way they did that. Certainly, certainly an interesting critter. Let's flip it over. And flipping them over, we see yet another very distinctive feature. The cocking handle, the charging handle on the Albanian is kind of trigger shaped. Not unlike a Kalashnikov and I would say it is a little bit more ergonomic probably a little easier to machine too interestingly they did leave the lightning cut in the bolt carrier the safety is of the more simplified pattern though flipping it over here's our comparing our pig stickers very similar but they are cut slightly differently. Now this is just my Albanian SKS. There are differences. These were produced at the Amrash Arsenal from roughly 1967 through 1971. In the first couple of years, they did not build that many. Then they would kind of ramp up to building nearly 3,000 per year. 
but then they would seem to stop. And for whatever reason, they would pick back up in 1976. Again, pretty low rate production. And then it would spike at about 4,000 one year, and then end by 1979. So production run was from 67 to 79, but we had a pretty major break of four years in the middle. There are some undated examples that no one knows when they're from. Could they be early production from 67? Could they be late production using leftover parts, say, from 1980? Or could they be from this time period? We really don't know. And we don't know exactly how many were made. Low estimates have it at about 16,500. High estimates are maybe 18,000. Small numbers. Now these were not built for the Albanian army as such. They were mostly built for the police and maybe other security guard type forces. Which would make sense for a, a 10 shot self-loading carbine with, you know, a more or less fixed magazine stripper clip fed. Again, with pig sticker bayonet. But these are quite rare in America. As the commonly accepted story goes, many of these SKSs were destroyed in the 1990s following disarmament talks and whatnot in that part of the world post-Cold War. At least 11,000 are said to have been destroyed, leaving hmm, six to maybe 7,000 left in the world. And of these, it's estimated that the vast majority are here in the USA, but it's still a very small number. 5,000 at most. It's not the rarest gun. Certainly an East German would be rare. But these were imported quite some time ago. In quality, condition, all that varies widely. There are a few other AKs, excuse me, SKSs. I've been doing this a while now. Worth talking about. The Type 63 out of North Korea. We know nothing about these. Kind of standard for North Korean guns. The only oft-repeated fact about them is that there was a grenade launcher variant, at least produced in some numbers. There's also the Vietnamese Type 1. Now, some people say that Vietnam created theirs. Others, like myself, though, feel that these were either Russian or Chinese SKSs that were reconditioned, refurbished, maybe remarked and restocked in Vietnam. So even if they maybe were rebuilt in Vietnam, it seems like the original receivers and whatnot would have been Chinese or perhaps earlier Russian. But it's worth pointing them out because they did show up in the war and afterwards. And as I said, there are some variations in production style for the Albanian as well, depending on what year you end up with. And quality is kind of all over the place. Very interesting guns, though. Well, there's kind of a walkthrough of SKS variants. What do you think? So here we are, all lined up again. I didn't feel like going to the couch. So, you get this. And of course, all of these are available, or have been available in the U.S., and at one time they were quite inexpensive. Looking at our Russians, the majority of ones, such as like the KBIs, were refurbished and put into long-term storage and then eventually sold off to importers here, KBI, Century, what have you. So they'll have the kind of sanded, reworked, reshellac stock. They'll have that black stoving on the blued parts. And they'll have bolts that are still kind of either plum colored or kind of a dull silver color. Now these two, I'm sure, have been refurbished to some extent, but they're what I would consider light refurbs. 
and guns like these just kind of came in with the regular Russian SKSs because if they didn't need refurbishing they didn't do it these were once quite affordable although they were always a little more expensive than say the Chinese and the nice thing is they are considered CNR because the Soviet Union no longer exists and the majority will be Tula if you find that new Shesk, good on you you should pick it up moving on to the Romanians because they produce far fewer these are not nearly as common and often they're in pretty well pretty well used condition if you run across one in decent shape that's numbers matching or even force matched it's probably not a bad thing and again I'm sure these have been refurbished but they do retain more of a original blued finish with bolt in the white look and these M56s are just kind of collectible in and of their own right. I think they're neat, even though they're very similar to our Russian friend over here. Probably in recent years, the most storied one would be our Yugos, and we've had all, all kinds of variants. I picked this one up quite early in the import run. These first started to appear here in late 2003, and I bought this one in spring of 2004. Before that, you didn't see a whole lot of the Zestava guns. And they had all kinds of grades and conditions. And it wasn't a whole lot more to jump up in condition, like 10 to 20 bucks. And that's why I did pick this one up. I think I paid 100 bucks for it. 110 maybe, then. And they came with the sling cleaning kit. Uh, am um, ammunition pouch to hold stripper clips. To be fair, the Russians came with all the goodies too. Sling, uh canvas pouch all that good stuff i guess i could have dug all that out but guys doing these takes long enough this is taking me all afternoon so if you think watching this takes a while trust me setting up for it and taking everything away even longer anyway i digress you guys are neat and they were affordable for a long time the other thing to watch out for as i mentioned they do not have chrome line bores and these were actually used so if you Look for one, make sure A, the bore is not pitted and corroded, and B, the gas system, this adjustable system, where am I at here? Me, I am completely lost. There we are. This adjustable system, especially this valve here, it can be frozen in the corroded position, so make sure it moves freely. And if you can, take the gas system apart to check it out, because sometimes... These will look gorgeous on the outside and be just rotten in the bore. A little wear is fine, but you don't want one where the gas system is frozen up. And these are uh, CNR today because they quit making them back in uh, 1970 and because Yugoslavia no longer exists. But we get to the Chinese, and a lot of these are not CNR. And this has kept the price reasonable, at least until lately. The reason they're not, unless you find those out of Albania, you can't really prove that they're that old because a lot of them were not dated or clearly marked. This is the ATF's interpretation. Plus, China as a nation still exists, unlike the Soviet Union or Yugoslavia. So you have to kind of watch out for that. Now, there are... All kinds of variants of these. These are in early and late military. There are some stamped receiver ones, which you would think might make them worth less, but actually the stamped receiver Chinese SKSs are worth a great deal because they're quite uncommon. Another one you'll run in into are the ones designed to feed from Kalashnikov AK Mags. There's a few versions. There's the AK, excuse me, there's the SKSD, the SKSM, the SKSS. There is that uh, one I showed you a few years ago, the Navy Arms Carbine Import. These were all done for the American market, typically modified in China, but sometimes by the importer. So quality of workmanship can be from very good to nearly dangerous. I've even had a couple of customers buy them and then sell them immediately. Not buy them from me, but buy them from other dealers and sell them because they just didn't, uh, didn't trust them. But just know they are commercial. Likewise... All of your SKSs have the 20 and a half inch barrel. China did sell some 
16 to 16 and a half barrel carbines, usually calling them the paratrooper here, but these were all cut downs. They uh, were either cut down in America by the importer or over in China by the factories. They did not ever field in the People's Liberation Army a 16 inch version. You can also tell because they cut down the, the bayonet to match the barrel. They're neat and handy, but yeah, there are even some carbines from the 90s that have a shortened gas system. But again, mostly a commercial venture, venture here. So once you get outside of the military style guns, just be wary because you are getting into um, kind of commercial grade SKSs out of China. Because they sent a lot of them over. And then finally, of course, we have the Albanian again. As I said, there's a few thousand in America. Some are in rough shape, some are in okay shape. Some are perfectly safe to shoot. Others, you might need to get a gunsmith to check out. Quite interesting. And these are dated. So determining CNR status is relatively, uh, relatively easy. Very unique variant, though. So how many SKSs exist in the world? Boop. I can tell you this. The majority were made by China. I've seen estimates about 15 million which when you consider Yugoslavia made half a million, Russia made a couple of million for sure. Then we have Romania, East Germany, North Korea, Albania didn't make many, but that those add up. And if China really did make 10 million plus, yeah, you can see how we can approach 15 million. Maybe not quite that many, but it gives you a rough idea. And uh, they are a pretty common rifle even in America today. Back when I was younger in the 90s, when you found SKSs, Russian, even Chinese, in gun shops, they would often be wearing Tapco furniture, a cheesy folding stock. Even they replaced the mag with a crappy 20 or 30 round mag. But luckily today, people seem to give these a lot more appreciation, and I don't run across the, the Tapcoed out ones near as often. And unfortunately, when people did that, they often killed the value because they lost serial matching parts. Early Russian guns like these have a lot of serial numbers, as do Romanians. Uh, Yugoslavians are interesting. They have some serials. They also have assembly or part numbers, which usually have lots of ones and zeros in them. Chinese guns, they have fewer serials, especially export ones or kind of more sanitized ones like these. So, they may not always have serialized parts, but there's a lot that goes into it. Keep in mind, these are older guns, and keep in mind, except for the earliest Russians, they have floating firing pins. So, they're designed for hard primer, military-grade ammo. If you use commercial ammo, be safe, keep the gun pointed in a safe direction, because runaway fire is a possibility with an SKS, any of them. And there are aftermarket kits to retrofit your bolt with a spring-loaded firing pin. Not a bad idea if you plan on shooting it. Also, it's a good idea to invest in some good-looking, good-condition stripper clips, chargers, because that's how these are meant to be fed. They are not really meant to be fed single at a time from the top. That's not always a great recipe. But yeah, it's a really interesting gun. It's from the same era as the Satan 1 Grand, the FN-49, the original Moss 49, or 44 for that matter. Kind of that brief blip in between bolt actions and select fire. Where they still used mill receivers, where they still had relatively long barrels, but it was still wood, steel, and the iron of men. <laughs> So it definitely has a place in history. And that's where I wanted to do a dedicated SKS variants video. And with that, I'll let you go. Which one is your favorite? Or do you have a different one you like? Let me know in the comments. Let's talk some SKSs. Neat, neat guns in their own right, in my opinion. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, 
please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.